Right. Um, I, I just want to start with something in case I forget, really, which is that um, I once taught the dental students for about 15 years. And I did that because it was thought that social workers were the best communicators in the welfare state. So that's, that's arguable. Um, what I learned, though, in that process was uh, a competition between uh, dental schools and medical schools about who was the cleverest uh, and who was the most important. And my partner was teaching medical students at the time. And what I learned was that uh, doctors are trained for arrogance, actually. They're trained for, don't you let anybody tell you what to do. That was the phrase. And particularly not a nurse. <coughs> or anybody else. And uh, it felt like nurses were trained in compliance. Do as you're told. Don't rock the boat. And then it seemed to me that the social workers were actually being trained for defiance, which is stand up for those who are discriminated against, put down, shoved out, neglected, forgotten. And indeed it's been written into our code of practice, a little bit more watered down. Uh, in, 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 it's in the uh, benchmark statement for social work, where you won't find it for nurses or anybody else. And it's interesting to give social work that role, which is almost like the conscience of society. Um, because, uh, like all human beings, it's hard to uh, be the conscience of society um, if we're presented with indifference. And here I'm reminded of the work of Winnicott, in fact. Which is, I think it's true to say that the opposite of love isn't hate but indifference. Because indifference you don't count at all. You don't have a person, you're not a person, you've got a personhood. And there is no better example for me of indifference than this government. And so I decided to put in my kind of a description of myself, uh, my political background, because it seemed to me important to do so. Um, so I, I come here as a political, as, as a political activist, as I think you know, if you've read the story. Um, I'm active in the NHS, in the Protect Our NHS in Bristol, which we've been um, working on protecting the NHS for six years. We're one of the most successful groups in the country, in fact. I've been taking our clinical commissioning group to a judicial review and winning, because they were refused to... Um, negotiate with the public to collaborate or consult the public, um, for which we blame always for wasting NHS money because they had to defend themselves in court to be found guilty, of course. Um, but also we're active in trying to make sure that some of the provision in Bristol and their surrounding area isn't lost to privatisation, so we will know that Virgin is sitting on the doorstep waiting to privatise the children's services and adult services. So we've got a big job on our hands. And then I, of course, think about social work. Um, I'm a retired social worker. Uh, I can never work out what that means, really, because uh, there's a lot to do in this life. And I feel very privileged to have been part of a group whose education was paid for by the state. And therefore, it feels uh, incumbent on me to return the favour that was offered to me, which was education. And uh, since we're part of a, a very privileged group, those of us who are old enough to be privileged, it seems to be right and proper that we work to ensure that the next generation do not struggle in the way that they currently are. Um, so a political uh, social work or political life seems to me to just be the bread and butter of being alive. And I think there's a way in which the profession is being killed off and neoliberalism or its operating system, managerialism, is one of the best ways I've ever seen of making sure that people just don't know what to do in impossible situations. Now, I didn't mean to say any of that, really, but it, Michael kind of brought those thoughts to mind. Um, and it, sometimes it's hard to do a broad brush, like saying, so doctors are trained for arrogance. Because as soon as you say that, thing, you can think of a hundred who aren't. Um, but there's a climate within which uh, professions operate. And this, they, they are territorial sometimes. 
And so making bold statements that people can argue with is not really about whether, you're, whether I'm right or wrong. It's much more about whether we can have a conversation about it so we can actually unpack what's going on in the world that we share. And what I really enjoyed about this conference, among many things, is uh, your capacity, of the capacity I've seen, to make connections. It's quite extraordinary, because I really struggle in other, in other contexts for people to make a connection between one and another, one point and another. And I think it comes from uh, your work of group analysts, really, from those of you who are, because there's all the time the uh, desire to make connections. Or sometimes I describe it as uh, psychoanalysis will always ask the question why, and others will always ask the question what. And it just seems to me the why question, why do things happen as they are, as they do, is an absolutely crucial question for us all to ask and to continue asking throughout our lives. So let me start. I'm going to start with um, uh, the fact I can't really leave social work because I feel like I'm a social worker. I'm a, I'm a mother of social work sitting at the bedside of a, a very sick uh, profession. And I, I can't leave it because I can't abandon my siblings who are distressed and upset and disturbed by the impossible tasks they're being given in this crazy world. And uh, so I feel I, I keep going backwards and forwards into social work um, on, on invitation of my hand. So I'm going to write to, uh, talk about why I write this paper, why I wrote it, on humanizing and dualism, but, uh, a brief account of the current picture of social work as I see it. Uh, the central task of social work, as I see it, which is understanding and action. And of course it's action outside the sphere of the clinic or the room as well as inside it. The managerial's attack on our profession, our professional judgments, our decision making. And judgments being replaced by a computer-based or manual-based one-size-fits-all approach. And I will just go into that, I know I've had enough of it, but I'll, I'll try and raise your spirits a bit more at the end. Hopefully. And I'll give you some examples of what, what the punishment social workers get and their resilience, if you like. Well, I'm sick of the word, I must tell you, because social workers are also sent on resilience forces. Um, and we need the government to want one, where they resign at the end of it. <laughs> because we certainly can't live in a world that's conceptualised like this, good one. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, my... my my success in the sphere of social work was never really keeping a job, because that was hard, given the fact I've always had a lot of views. But I wrote uh, a book as an academic practitioner called uh, Social Work Skills, a Practice Handbook. And then I changed it to Social Work Skills uh, and Knowledge, because I wrote a whole section on what constitutes knowledge in the third edition. And uh, this book is hugely successful. It's, it's in nine and seven languages and it sold over 50,000 copies. And I didn't bring any copies with me. First, because I haven't got any. And secondly, because I'm, I'm writing a fourth edition, and it would cheat you to give you a book that I'm actually going to change the flavour of. So, uh, but you can get hold of it. It's relatively easy to get hold of. Um, and I'm writing, speaking today about this article on humanising managerialism. And I came to write it because I must have known, um, since I retired, uh, so called, given about 500 lectures, workshops, whatever, across the world. Uh, and I nearly always bring managerialism in, because wherever I go, whether it's in Singapore or uh, Australia, it's recently New Zealand, um, Ireland, I was speaking a lot, um, managerialism is dominating. It's largely because of the influence of the United States, because our biggest tragedy is that we speak English, or that they speak American English because their work translates so easily into our culture. I don't know if you know it, but the, 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 the birth of the United States was a very tight vote between German as their national language or English, uh, as you can tell in which one, more or less. Um, and uh, one of the problems in social work is we get American journals or American articles coming in or books coming in. And actually, because the United States isn't based on a welfare state, it's, it's quite problematic to, uh, for social workers to use these books without thinking. 
does this apply to my country and the situation I'm in? Because as you well know, it's a highly, highly individualised culture in the United States, um, evident in their right to carry guns all the time. Um, <clears throat> as one, one example. And it doesn't translate easily to a culture, a European culture, which is based on basic, uh, a more community-based or communal approach to life and our connection to each other. Anyway, I came to write this paper because I just kept listening to the plight of the social workers who couldn't understand what was happening to them and how they had to, why they had to fill out these forms or what was happening. And uh, so I thought, I'll go and try and unravel it. And then I came across managerialism. Now, it's not a word that it was much used in social work when I was first started writing about it about 10 years ago, speaking about it. Um, Interestingly, when I was speaking in the United States and a couple of universities there, they don't, they don't know the word, they call it bureaucracy. And as somebody pointed out earlier, it's much, much more than bureaucracy. It's reorganised our whole life and how we think about things. And I was recently, last week, in fact, speaking in our Northern Ireland to people over there, at their invitation. And their invitation, the title they chose was how can we to return to therapeutic social work? It's a lovely title. I never gave it to them. They gave it to me. Um, because there's a huge desire in social work to return to a, f a form of, um, of action and connection that isn't just based on pieces of paper. And one of the uh, participants of that conference sent me their assessment form. And here it is. It's 18 pages long. And she says, and she's right, and you can't tell anything about the family crimes. It's the kind of plight that you really need to know about from these 18 pages that they have to fill in. So they're spending all the time, something like 80% of the time in some service, filling out these forms. And they've never, never been able to do any work for that reason. Anyway, so I'm, I'm really a commentator on the state of social work, and then I write about it. So I'm a recently writer, really written about the use of self in social work, because it's a phrase that's used a great deal. Perhaps not in group analysis, certainly in counselling. And it's just uh, very unclear what it means. So that was the latest paper that was published by the British Journal of Social Work, that came out last week. And I'm now writing about uh, the importance of uh, non-verbal communication, because that seems to be dropping off social work, social work's agenda. And it's interesting what, what social workers get taught, because when I first started, Non-verbal communication was, was very important, or it's certainly important in practice. I was trained in a, on a Marxist course, so I didn't know anything about social work much, but I knew quite a bit about Marxism. Um, what I should have done, having had that kind of experience. Um, so um, I'm drifting across issues where I find confusion in social work, and uh, this paper on the non-verbal communication is proving very difficult to write. It's such a big subject. Um, but one that's interesting, becoming more interesting for uh, in the world of neuroscience, which I think has some very interesting possibilities. Though I must say here, there's a lovely quote from one of my social colleague, colleagues, which says, um, as soon as you see a picture of the brain, or people's brains, thinking stops in our brain. And I think it's true. That it seems that such a positive in science. This, these pictures of brains go around, but it's got huge things to say to social work and I think to other professions. So, I'm summarising the areas. Remembering I'm trying to uh, introduce ideas to social workers, so I've, I'm giving you the ideas that I give to social workers because that seems uh, appropriate and I'm coming from the down, from the bottom upwards rather down. So, anyway, here's the three years of social work economy, efficiency. And effectiveness of the three M's, markets, managers, and management. I think I can only just see this. That is do more for less, minimum input, maximum output, or markets make money for the few, but not for the many. So, just to bring it to that, the numbers of registered social workers in the United Kingdom, in England. The different uh, countries have different uh, systems for their social workers. <coughs> Roughly 90,000 are like with nursing, they're dropping out very fast. 
possibly towards group analysis, hopefully, or something like that. And there's some social workers here, but one, people here who want social workers and found their way to a profession. Uh, Children's Services is now uh, governed by the Department of uh, Education and Adult Services by the Department of Health. I don't, and I don't know if the situation has changed, but they didn't used to speak very much to each other. Um, largely because one was led at that one time by uh, Martin Neri, a well-known uh, Tory, and the other one was led by the um, <coughs> Department of Health, was led by uh, uh, Crosdale, Crosdale Appleby, who used to head, I think, uh, community care. And they had an argument about the state of uh, social work education. A lot of the arguments about social work tend to be focused on education rather than what we do, which is interesting in itself. Um, there's been loads and loads of um, surveys and reports on social work education. Anyway, these two uh, were invited to write reports on social work education. Martin Neri came out with a view that social workers in the three-year programme shouldn't be trained in, uh, shouldn't have a generic qualification, but in the third year they should train in specialisms, particularly child protection. And uh, Crosby Appleby didn't agree. He said that he should be generalist and, um, in, the, in the three years. And uh, afterwards, uh, the post qualifying elements should be um, specialised. And that's what won, um, thankfully, one might add. But it's the argument that matters that people are arguing from two different departments that are central to social work about what social work should be and how it should be taught. One of the problems, therefore, of social work more generally is this problem of recruitment, and there's much more a problem of retention, which I've mentioned earlier. And there's an ongoing uh, tension between the relationship of the private to the public, and certain sections, sections of social work have already been sold off, or, or parts of them have been sold off, particularly adoption and fostering. Um, but as you well know, uh, uh, social care, which constantly is confused with social work, is massively privatised, and hence its problems, I would argue. Um, because it's got a profit motive in there, it's, it's much more costly than it would be if it did not have a profit motive. So the confusion between social and social care is ongoing. And indeed, in some social work departments or sections, the word social work cannot be found on a Saturday case review for a child. And not at one point was the word social work used, the word social care was used all the time. And yet social workers are trained very differently than social care workers who tend not to be trained at all. Um, or some may be, but, but not in the way that social workers are. You know, that's just an overview. So what we know in social work is that the relationships are central to survival. So here's a quote from a very esteemed writer, David Howe, the poor of the quality of people's relationship history and social environment. The less robust would be their psychological makeup an ability to deal with other people, social situations and emotional demands. And that's a very good sum summary of the kind of light that uh, social workers experience on a day-to-day -day basis when working with people whose major, major preoccupations are poverty, debt, uh, poor housing, poor transport, poor jobs, poor community resources, poor health, everything pretty much poor. And yet, this, the vitality of relationships is captured by this quote from Bruce Perry, who works in the United States in the area of child abuse. And he says, the very nature of humanity arises from relationships. Essentially, everything that's important about life, as a human being, you learn in the context of relationships. And that's a very important quote uh, for me, because um, it reminds me, from my reading of uh, neuroscience and neuro papers from that, that discipline, that we actually learn through our emotions. It's thought we learn through our brains and cortex, but in fact we learn through our emotions. And it does say that the, 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 the more that we have in our emotional experience with each other, the more we learn. And I'm going to talk, going to talk about that problem in social work as to the delivery of a non-service. So again, with using scholars from uh, political science and some who are interested in the discipline of uh, neuroscience, we have Leslie Furley saying that understanding 
is a marriage of heart and minds. The heart listens and speaks to the emotions and feelings being conveyed, and the mind seeks to explore the context that give rise to experiences that are happening or have happened in a person's life. And a very, again, a very, I think a very good summary of the importance that relationships hold in opening the door to understanding, understanding another human being, and in social work, understanding another human being in the context within which they live and work. So it's the context which is also crucial in social work. So from this, I've defined relationship-based practices and the fundamentals of understanding leading to action as the relationships we create are fundamental to understanding and action. And it is this understanding and the recognition and meaning given to experience that shapes the way we work with people. The aware and unaware emotions and feelings that all parties bring to an encounter. And here I'm talking about other professionals as well as family members or people in the community. That the feelings that all parties bring to an encounter and the impact of wider social, social factors constitute a central element of the understanding that's achieved and the actions based on that understanding. So given the fact that from my perspective that social work has to be based on understanding, attempting to understand the human being, then managerialism poses a real threat because it is not its interest. So my concern in terms of talking to social work has been to, to look at social work judgments and decision making and to see uh, how this is shaped within the context within that are currently working. And one of the things that's come to mind is the, is the view that social workers tend to think, and often other professionals I think, that people are working from uh, conscious intentions. Now, perhaps in the realm of psychoanalysis, that would be least uh, dominant, and that's also such a rich uh, area. I'll pause here just to say that, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, although I'm normally talking to social workers, I'm normally introducing psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic ideas to social workers. Here I'm introducing social work to you, which seems a bit odd, and I haven't been in this psychoanalytic sphere for a long time, except that I remembered, and I don't know how I came to forget, that uh, I was invited to do a talk at a, a conference on Winnicott uh, about two years ago at the, I think, uh, Freud Institute, maybe the Institute of Psychoanalysis and, and the Freud Center. I can't remember who put it on, because again, I don't live in this world. And I enjoyed it hugely. But I was invited to do that because I, uh, uh, about 30 or 40, 35 years ago, I set up with other feminists uh, a project in Bristol called Womankind, where we were delivering a group work, in fact, to women who were struggling with mental health issues, particularly depression. And I used the work of Winnicott in that work with depressed and troubled women, uh, where, I, where I was for 10 years. So that's why I kind of some sort of back. But it's interesting, I forgot entirely that I, uh, I uh, was at that conference. Um, and it's hard to get your mind into psychoanalytic thinking if you, you're outside it, because um, there's a language that you use that isn't the uh, ordinary currency in my life right now. I'm not saying I don't enjoy it or find it stimulating, because I do, but it's, uh, I'm working in the political sphere, where, for example, the unconscious is very, very rarely mentioned. Um, and so there's a work to be done there. Which reminds me that I do think um, politicians need to be at conferences of this caliber because they need to hear some of the excellent uh, presentations that have been given to unpack this very complex area, which is really trying to unpack uh, how society is currently working at this point in time. So uh, this conference is to be applauded on several fronts uh, for that kind of uh, input and challenge. Anyway, back to this. I'm reminding social workers that people aren't always conscious of what they're doing. Uh, and that there's an unconscious element to it. And in other words, an unknown element. But there's also a, a non-conscious element. And it's in the non-conscious that much uh, of behaviour actually lies, which I'll go on to in a minute. Um, 
And by randoming, the, the behaviour often becomes very patterned, or is patterned. Behaviourists have done a lot on this subject. I think uh, neuroscience is unpacking it a bit more about how the brain and brain maps get uh, set in place through experience. And of course, experience is a key, is a key to uh, human development and, and brain development. Anyway, reminding socials of the extent to which brain behaviour is patterned, intentional and unintentional. And it's quite clear that social workers work with people who do not want to know what they know. They do not want to know what they know. So they want the social workers to know that they may be harming their children, that they're not taking the drugs or the medication that they were prescribed. Or maybe that they don't want social workers to know that they really are exploiting that elderly lady who's lying up in bed as they siphon off her money. They do not want social workers to know what they know. Which means social workers have to be pretty smart. Pretty, I hate that word, so pretty intelligent to unpack what is going on, why. Um, so the difference between intentional and unintentional behaviour is crucial. And largely, people don't know, or we don't know, or it is not known, the extent to which our behaviour is intentional or not. Even if it's considered conscious. And then social workers are concerned with the extent to which emotional, the inside world, and the social, the outside world, uh, influence the problems they're facing. And, and social work is not, and should never be, solely concerned with the inside world of the individual. It has to be concerned with how the outside world got inside them. <coughs> and I'm sure psychoanalysis, and I think psychoanalysis is a sin. Oh, that's not what I argue with. And we again return to Leslie Thurls, where the political philosopher, he's trying to understand the nature of judgments, and again using, using neuroscientific uh, ideas to shape some of his thinking. He says practical judgment entails an understanding of the psychology of people with whom one interacts. This insight is based on access to non-rational orientations and activities, of which affect is a crucial component. Practice, practical judgment in this respect has at least as much to do with unreason as reason. And that point about unreason is crucial because I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, people's uh, ideas, thoughts, feelings being dismissed because they're not reasonable rather than trying to unpack how did they get to that place? What factors played a part? I should say here that some of the great thinkers that I been drawing on, and there are some great thinkers in this country too, um, are American. I'm not normally, uh, as I said earlier, uh, a fan of the United States, not, not its people, its policies. Um, so, uh, but sometimes Americans can, I think, really think round corners when they, get, when they get courageous. And I think sometimes their institutions help that strangely in ways that ours don't. Our intellectual, uh, our intellectual abilities, I think, in universities are becoming increasingly narrowed. And that's a great pity. It's a tragedy, actually, because universities should be uh, the home of, um, of inquiry, exploration, learning. And increasingly, it's being uh, confined and controlled, again, by people's interpretation of managerialist agenda. So this is about the, what, what um, Thurl calls the cognitive unconscious, which Donatio, another well-known writer in the field of neuroscience, calls the non-conscious, uh, sort of sure. And here he says, uh, in, in arguing the role of the non-conscious, or correct, uh, co co cognitive unconscious, neuroscientists claim that our eyes absorb and pass on the brain over 10 million signals in each second. The other four senses also contribute extensively. Our conscious mind, in contrast, can only process about 40 pieces of information each second. That is a small share of what is made available to us. Indeed, it is estimated that our sense organs collect between 200,000 and 1 million bits of information for every bit of information that enters our awareness. Conscious perception represents only the smallest fraction of what we absorb from our daily, our worldly encounters. It is the tip of an iceberg. Again, that's very challenging as a statement, 
in the conscious unconscious debate. Um, it touches on the importance of tacit knowledge, in fact, beyond his work, and saying that I was looking at the, uh, we've got a little baby in our life now, a grandchild, just looking at how much he absorbs or has absorbed in the first eight months of his life. And I am amazed. He's like a sponge. And that is the realm of tacit knowledge. We may never ever be able to describe what he's learning, but he is learning all the time. And it's just lovely to watch you get that chance. And I'm enjoying it. Anyway, managerialism is undervalued in professional judgments is crucial. And I, some might say it's an attack on the professions, and I do think it probably is. And it's not confined to social work. Let me get my clock back on. So the arguments that came up from the work of Eileen Monroe, who wrote four pa papers on her social work education in the, in the realm of child protection. And it's interesting with that split between the Department of Health and the Department of Education, that when I go into the realm of uh, adult care, they don't know about uh, Monroe's excellent work in the way that they would in the realm, uh, for those who work in the realm of child protection or working with children and families. I should say here that I was once a manager of a children and family centre. Um, and so, it's again, trying to get across this divide between the two departments. But anyway, understanding and engaging with human beings involves much more than logical reasoning, is what Eileen Monroe came up with, and she was right. And she's using the same papers, or she's referencing the same works that I, I've just been re re uh, um, citing to you, or some of them. And the conscious, unconscious, and non conscious sources of information, intuitive reasoning, need to be involved. So she's arguing really for what she calls intuitive reasoning. And there's another reason why I came to write a paper on managerialism, is to reintroduce this phrase of uh, um, intuitive or emotional reasoning. And um, here she's got a lovely quote about the, the visit of a social worker to a family. This is the social worker. The social worker's conscious mind is paying attention to the purpose of their visit. At an intuitive level, they are forming the picture of the dynamics of the room, noting evidence of anger, confusion, or anxiety. This feeds into their conscious awareness and helps shape the way the interview progresses. Their own emotional reaction is one source of information. Previous reforms have concentrated too much on the explicit logical aspects of reasoning, and this has contributed to a skewed management framework that undervalues intuitive reasoning and emotions, and thus fails to give appropriate support to those aspects. What's interesting for me about that quote is about um, their emotional reaction is one source of information, because actually that's what's being written out of social work, how social workers feel about the work that they're doing. And again, that's evident in managerial, in management, in supervision, where we see um, supervision being a managerial, following a managerial framework of a tick box approach to have you done, basically task based rather than uh, an, an exploration of the emotional life and struggles and distress and difficulties and joys that come with the work. So I, I argued in the, in the later paper that emotions need to be given the status of facts because if we don't, if we don't upgrade it, it's going to be downgraded. So I'm trying to upgrade the importance of emotion. People contact me from the NHS. I'm trying to keep my... Uh, my eye on the time, and I'm getting these messages. Stop it is all I can say. I co convened this uh, protect on the chest with other colleagues, so there's a lot going on, uh, as you can hear, or you read about in the paper. And with these, this is a very good survey, or it's a very good summary of the kinds of complexities that social workers are facing. And of course, social workers still go into the home. Uh, probation officers no longer do this, interestingly, or tend not to. The Northern Ireland situation is slightly different. Um, and actually, the, whole, the home visit is crucial. It's so uh, important to see people in their natural environment. We learn so much about how people live on a day-to-day -day basis. The smells, the feeling, the, the just the construction of the room. Um, particularly smells are crucial in social work. Um, the smell of poverty is, in, is one that never leaves you. 
And if you come across it, then you know that something's not wholesome within the family. Anyway, she brought it together, a very good summary. But, um, but because the, the reports were um, commissioned by the government, the, the Tory government, I usually call them kind of crooks, actually. I'm trying to be good here. But they are crooks. Yeah. Um, uh, Munro's impact, I think, was seriously limited because she didn't really have a political analysis or she didn't have the way with all to uh, enter the political domain. Perhaps because she's still employed by, in her research project by the department, of, um, whichever department is, would be the department of the... Whichever, well, anyway, she's employed. And it might not be if she, keeps, she speaks out. Which is a shame, because at one level, but maybe it isn't, because she's a very good commentator on social work. And it's up to others to use her work creatively, because it's not everybody has to do it. We don't all do everything. And that reminds me that even if we can't um, change things within the work context, sometimes we can tell what's happening to somebody else who can do something for us, so that we protect people's jobs, but also that we can kind of get some strategies for taking the information outside so that others in the world or in our society know about what's going on. Anyway, back to this. Monroe also re uh, emphasised the importance of intuition. And again, it's been written out of social work, and it's not part of the managerialist agenda, because it's nearly impossible to measure intu intuition. <coughs> Though I'm sure somebody's going to come up on a scale of 1 to 10, how intuitive are you? And the answer would be, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Think what he says. Or just do naught and ten at the same time. Oh, somewhere along this spectrum. Since spectrum is the word of the day. Anyway, back to intuition. The intuitive, ex intuitive expertise is built up through pattern recognition. And this has implications for how social workers should be trained, managed, and provided with a career path that values and promotes the continuing development of expertise. Now that's near revolutionary to say that in social work these days. But she's right. And again, she's returned back to education. The problem is that this education is generally betrayed as meaning replacing intuition with conscious, rational thought. The alternative, however, is not simply to give free range to intuitions. The task is to educate them. And that last kind of comes back to as we further. And I think it's very interesting to think about educating intuition because it feels like it's a contradiction to educate. But what it's really saying is if we don't bring it out into the open and really unpack its characteristics, how did you get to this viewpoint? We can never understand how important this is. And it's very much, for me, it's very much about the feelings that pass between people um, that we pick up. But of course, ours can get merged with theirs and we can be wrong. So the, this, uh, this idea of sharing and speaking and talking and exploring is crucial to unpacking this the importance of nutrition. But I say here that managerialism is unlikely to support the education of intuition. I think that stands to reason. Okay. Instead, what managerial offers is a prescribed computer-based or manual-based, one size fits all assessment process and a tick box approach where assessment is prioritised over the work of sorting out and working through the problems presented. And here I'm reminded of uh, a number of uh, cases where uh, parents have been taken to the court, to court on their parenting, where one or two judges have uh, turned the case round and told the social worker, go and do the work. Where the work has merely been to try, or through, or through an assessment task, whether or not parents can and are good enough when it comes to wonderful phrase. But um, you can't know that from afar. You have to actually work with people to find out what hinders their um, working capacity, their capacity to care for their children. And here I'm reminded of a, a mother <coughs> who came across um, through a circuitous route and she was heading for the courts uh, on her poor parenting and she had five tasks to complete to demonstrate or evidence her capacity to be a good mother. And one of the tasks that she had, she had five children, was um, to put a medicine cap 
written on the wall so that the one child she had that was epileptic could have his medicine put higher up so he, he wasn't at risk. So it was a risk. This mother's capacity to put a, a cabinet on the wall was as good as my in, enjoying managerialism. It was non-existent. And yet it was a task that was set, it was one of about four or five, many of which she could not achieve. But what was missing from the form, it seemed to me, or the social approach, or the, the, the approach taken by the department, was that this mother delivered these children to school every single morning and collected them. You'd think that such dedication as goes with that kind of gesture would be recognised somewhere, but what was focused on was the tasks that they'd set that she had to achieve. And so she's described, oh, one of them was to get a mattress. That's why I came in. I got her a mattress through a circuitous route. So she got one of them ticked off. Because the, the children were sleeping on one bed. The three of them were sleeping on one bed. It is crazy. It is crazy. Anyway, I'll go back. So we see here a series of targets where progress is, value, is evaluated and a person's motivation and commitment is constantly measured or evaluated or tested. And if then it often needs to refer along with, often to an outsourced and privatised, uh, and but particularly unmonitored to resource, resulting in often in case, case closure. And one of the problems here is what, um, what's happening in the sphere of social work and the resources available, which are, you well know are dwindling, is that the way that some agencies present the kind of services that they offer is way, is seriously exaggerated. There is more time in some situations that I've encountered in trying to get a glossy magazine out that tells all that they're not going to deliver than they actually are. And it's problematic that we, we actually encourage a corrupt system because those agencies know that they can't survive if they don't put out glossy magazines or glossy publications that, that, that covers almost anything and everything. And yet, some of them are best at doing something small but very well rather than trying to catch a funding that says that they've got to go across a very broad spectrum. So managerial is other, other dangers, or it reduces people to a target outcome or commodity, therefore personhood gets lost, just become a number. Ignores the complexity of human experience and situational uniqueness that problems carry. Oh yeah, there's my little timer. Now do I just stop it? Stop. Stop. It's like managerialism. It won't stop. Right. Okay. Stay so tuned to targets. I know I've done that. That's fine. Triggers defensiveness in individuals and organisations that encourage blaming, bullying, a complaints culture, and a watch your back tendency. Um, or mentality, and I've written about the importance of defences in social work, which again has tended to be forgotten. That social workers sometimes, in many situations, particularly in child protection, work with some of the most defended people that you can imagine. And some of the, the, the defences that people present to social workers is largely because they've previously been failed by a whole army of other professionals. For no better reason than managerialism has sometimes confined the work of that, that other profession so that it can't be effective or helpful. The excessive uh, data collection diverts funding resources and time from frontline provision. And that's not been mentioned so far, how much frontline work is actually bled by the fact that we've got this middle group who are constantly seeing whether or not somebody else has done the work. Um, and in, I saw a figure in nursing, and something like 20% of, uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, a very large percentage of been diverted out of frontline to this middle group that analyzed other people's work. The excessive data, yeah, and it gives a false sense of confidence in, politi in, in policies and procedures, and that was best seen in the situation that was focused on the death of um, what was called Baby P, where the, um, the manager of the, the where um, Sharon <coughs> Shoesmith, who headed Harringay Services, held up the, the findings was dead, which made the, her local authority you know, fit for purpose. And then Ed Balls set another uh, test through to that when, when the little baby died 
to make sure that the uh, Ofsted report said the opposite. But there is a confidence that if you're, you're ticking off boxes, you're actually doing the service. Or I'm some point performing a service. Or I've said, said it before, it's it was like if the memo passes between one desk and another, somehow the work's been done. And of course it hasn't. So there is a confidence in paper and paperwork that is ill-deserved in terms of its effectiveness. Except in some areas, it's very good to know how many children, for example, are in, in, in the care of our local authority. So some data is crucial. And I don't want to say all the data. I don't want to be anti-data. I just want to be intelligent in what we we actually accumulate because much of it can't be used because there's too much like this 18 page assessment much will not be used because it can't be unless they increase this middle band who will assess what's included in these forms the result is that I think we are delivering in too many cases a non-experienced people or we're offering the wrong kind of help. Interestingly here, I was working with another colleague of mine about communication skills, and my, one of my phrases uh, was uh, to say to service users, clients, um, how can I be helpful? In a better term than that, can I help? how can I be helpful? And my colleague says, you can't say that. And I said, why can't I say it? She said, well, we can't offer help anymore. <laughs> And you may laugh because when I wrote my first edition, the word help was outlawed. It was all insist, assist, uh, engage. Um, it, it was, you don't help. I think help's a very useful word. Not least because it's used in the street. Why wouldn't we use a language that everybody else uses? Rather than inform or insist. Empower. My God. Empower. Anyway. There, if you're the wrong kind of help, understanding is lost, confidence and trust in professionals is lost, and the opportunity for learning and change for both service users and social workers is lost. And this is crucial. Social workers also want to learn from others. That's where our joy is. The experience of caring is a human experience. It's felt emotionally. It's felt in warm, caring emotions that go between two people. And we need to have this emotional language return so that it's not just a thing but a whole experience that, some, that has to be of value to, uh, in the work that we do. Uh, so at another paper I say that every experience, every experience uh, is an opportunity, for, should be an opportunity for change. To change ourselves and to change others. And sometimes I'm asked how do people change and I say the best way to measure when the change is available is whether you have had your mind changed by another human being. Because that says that that person has the capacity to get through to your mind and you to recognise that difference. So the impact on social workers is, as like teachers, the burnt out support group, where they're leaning on each other with virtually any, much, not much, going between them in terms of trying to keep themselves going. But yet, the value here is that they're in a group. And I cannot underemphasize the importance of bringing people into groups. It's in groups that I think people often come alive, and that's my experience. But I have been a group worker for most of my life. And I had the, you know, and once did the IGA introduction to group work, which I thoroughly enjoyed that one year course. It was, uh, life changing. So managerialist controls and reprisals for social workers include uh, the, is um, the isolation desk. One social worker told me that she, if she doesn't fill out her assessments in time, she's sent to a desk at the other side of the room where nobody's allowed to go and talk to her. We call it the Coventry desk. Another, uh, in the southwest, there is what's called a shame board, where you know, their name is put on a shame board because they haven't kept their assessments up to task, because assessments are set within certain time periods. Um, in London, a practitioner working in, with uh, older people, she's allocated from a control centre uh, a certain number of minutes, 10, to, do, to work with different people, and they tell her every Monday exactly what the timetable is for the week. This person who allocates this work is not a social worker, and she's just expected to fly in 
with a box, tick, and a fly to it. And she was just on her knees with demoralisation. The intense monitoring I found in Northern Ireland last week, where in one case, in one case the social workers were not allowed to have a lunch break or a coffee break for fear of being monitored. Now, the extent of that is often dependent not only on the regime, but people's um, whether or not there's a manager buffering some of the worst excesses. Because certainly it seems to me that where social workers can stay on the job, there's usually a really good manager that knows how to negotiate the demands and to translate them in a particular way. In this case, that wasn't happening. The social workers being coerced into signing confidentiality agreements. Um, I'm not sure that's quite the right wording, but um, the non-disclosure agreements actually is better wording. Um, social workers not showing good practice. One social, one, one local authority re refused to, in a research project, they refused to share the, the, what they'd found in terms of good practice with another local authority in case the, local, the other local authority stole the ideas of them. So there's a lot of the idea stealing going on. Use of gagging posts to stop whistleblowers from speaking out about poor practice. And of course, whistleblowers and social workers can get a hard time. And the use of intimidation by employees to subdue or subdue silence unspoken to practitioners. These are things you can read in community care on an ongoing basis if you uh, want to find out more uh, uh, examples of the kind of pressures that are under social work. In other words, social workers, although taught to think for themselves in social work education programmes, and I do think that is the case, largely. But from that place, to think for yourself and to challenge has, um, can have serious consequences. And the most serious ones is that those social workers who have the, that courage uh, get, get worn out and burnt out and leave. I want to emphasise that not all agencies work or local authorities work in this way. Some are excellent in the care they provide. And they tend to be the, so the local authorities and agencies that keep their social workers. Yet, practitioners continue to resist. They're joining trade unions in Basel, and Basel's membership has gone up remarkably, remarkably. I think largely because the climate in social work has got so frightening because social workers are joining trade unions and the professional association to protect themselves. Um, I hear a lot about how social workers work between the radar or between the tracks. Try to work out where a manager is and can't find them. Uh, it's often said that, you know, until they put a video on me, I can do what I like outside the office. And there is a lot of defiance going on there, a lot of undercover, undercover work still being there. I've got a really good example of was the, the jamming of a computer. There was an assessment, there's a lovely research paper where the social workers just uh, arrested the computer to the point where the actual work could begin, begin and then allowed it to take its work forward. Um, it's a lovely, lovely example of uh, the resistance that's out there. The setting of support group, general meeting groups, social events. So there's, one, uh, there's one team in Bristol where they're, they're literally climbing the walls. They've set up a kind of climbing, climbing the wall climbing group and they go climbing the wall with each other. And again, they're staying together as, uh, as, as uh, practitioners that are enjoying each other. Um, they're finding strategies to, to deal with the excessive data collections. It's, it's see your own records is a nice one. Uh, or see previous detailed account. Because what happens is, if they don't put something in some of these boxes, the, the, the system gets jammed and it won't move on to the next stage. So they have to put something. So these phrases are really helpful, particularly see your own records. I love them. Um, encouraging friends outside social workers to be their spokesperson, write letters to the press, etc., and joining political parties and pressure groups like the one I'm very involved in, both uh, in the National Health Service and in the Labour Party. So there are some references for you uh, to look at if you wish to have. I want to end on poem. I want to end on how I end the paper. And I end the paper, uh, the paper on that humanising managerialism. Um, which is, uh, my, this is Michael's copy now. And I loved his talk, and I really enjoyed the previous ones. Um, I say, I believe as a human beings, we are capable of anything. Time and again throughout history, people have shown the ability to change the given order, despite the obstacles and barriers erected to hinder progress. The efforts of human beings can bring down 
if the efforts of human beings can bring down the Berlin Wall, it has to be possible to humanise managerialism. A task we need to begin now. And I'm going to end on a poem of mine. Um, well, I'm going to just mention one that I, uh, on a, on a, that was called We Will Leave None Behind, where I say, um, in relation to, uh, I say, for people who have forgotten the reason for our struggle and their importance to us, we must always remember them. And then I go on to a different poem, which is it. Um, would we be thought crazy or arrogant to see ourselves as travellers without maps, steering a course without compass, searching for ourselves, each other, and for safety in this beautiful but invaded earth? And if we're caught, should we, should we too remember to say that failure is impossible, since the pleasure and triumph was always and will always be in the journey itself. It has been really uh, lovely to be with you, to bring social work here. In, uh, in, I've never expected to have this kind of opportunity, and I'm uh, proud for that most generously. But it's been a very generous con uh, conference in total. It's been uh, delightful to experience you, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much.